Hi, my name is Colin. I'm going to be leading our service this morning. People are still coming in, finding seats. I mean, I think it started raining again. Well done for um, coping with the hour change. <laughs> although, although we were here early, I don't think anybody else arrived very early, so that's okay. We're going to be continuing our thoughts on 1 and 2 Samuel later on in the, uh, in the service, and Phil will be speaking to us about that. But let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the opportunity of coming together this morning and to share each other's company, to share in worship together. And we ask, Lord, that what we have to offer to you this morning may be acceptable. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've got two songs to start our service off this morning. And I'll invite you to stand to sing if you're able to do so. Praise him, you heavens, and then strength will rise. Praise him, you heavens, and the lights of God. Praise him, you angels, and heavens, and the Lord. Praise him. Praise him, the sun, moon, and bright shining stars. Praise him, you heavens, and Lord Jesus Christ.
and shuffle a few bits of paper around. We're going to spend just a few moments in prayer just now. Some of you know that I used to work in broadcasting. It sounds glamorous, but it wasn't. I was a volunteer and a freelance for both BBC and independent radio for a while, and then I worked as a producer for a broadcast news agency. And I've been a member of a group called Christians in Media for a number of years. And they've designated today as a day to encourage churches to pray for the media. That might sound like a huge task. Today, we are called consumers of news. There's so much of it around. Many of us, many of us rely on radio, television, and increasingly our mobile devices to get our news. And I believe some people still buy newspapers. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do myself, but still. But although we rely on the news companies and organizations for our news, they themselves get criticized for what they report and the way they report it. And of course, oftentimes the things they don't report. So I think it's good that we can take just a few moments today to pray for those who work in various outlets of the media. And there are many Christians working in the mainstream media, not just in religious broadcasting, or there's a number of those as well. So I think let's uh, pray, pray now. I'm going to use a prayer that's been specifically written for today. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray for all those who report news and views, who cover international, national and local events and activities. We pray give them wisdom to champion local causes and national causes too. May they promote and affirm all those working for the common good. May they speak of those who struggle to be heard or have no voice. May they challenge those with power. Help the media as they publicize local events and groups and as they spotlight all those seeking to make a positive difference in their neighborhoods. May the journalists seek out the good and positive stories as well as highlighting the challenging, the criminal and the controversial. We pray for those journalists developing new community media, especially in areas where news often goes unreported. We pray give these pioneers stamina and determination. And may their new editorial projects be successful. For all journalists, we pray that they may be fearless in declaring and defending truth and in speaking out for the truth tellers. We offer this prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who declared himself to be the truth and said, the truth will set you free. Amen. Just a couple of moments, a quiet to Perhaps add your own thoughts and your own prayers behind that too. And then we'll, we'll stand and we'll sing together in just a moment. We thank you, Father, that we can bring our prayers to you for such a big subject as the media in our country and across our world. And we ask that you'll take all our prayers as we offer them in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I just chose the next song to follow on from that, and we're going to sing, stand and sing together, Jesus, Hope of the Nations.
Good morning. Great to see you. Uh, just add my welcome to that you've received from Colin. And for those watching online as well, you are equally welcome. A few notices to let you know about in the life of our church. Uh, first of all, uh, some good news, some happy news. We can celebrate together with Pam and Graham on the occasion of their wedding anniversary. Am I allowed to say how many years? Why not? Good. 63 years of marriage. Must have been married very, very young, is all I can say. <laughs> but it's great. We celebrate with you guys. Congratulations. That's, that's just wonderful, isn't it? Also, uh, later on today, as you know, it's Halloween this weekend. And rather than celebrating darkness and all that's evil, we like to celebrate light and all that is good. So we have the family light night, uh, which is taking place later on uh, from 4 till 5.30. And then the youth light night. So uh, do come along to those, or encourage those who are appropriately aged to come along to those. And many of you will be aware that uh, another couple have a celebration coming up. Ian and Diana will be married next, or this coming Saturday. And uh, you only got 63 years ahead to go, which is wonderful, <laughs> isn't it? But <laughs> we want to celebrate with Ian and Diana as they, as they get married uh, on Saturday at 2 p.m. here at the church. Do come along if you would like to and celebrate with them. Uh, the prayer hour will take place again on not this Tuesday, but Tuesday week on the 7th. Uh, come along between uh, 7.30 and 8.30 to join us in prayer. And then November is very nearly here, which means December is almost here, which means Christmas is around the corner, which means... Oh, there you go. See, I thought you might get it. Yule Fest is coming up. Yule Fest is coming up. And we are in need of more volunteers as ever to help. There are all sorts of different uh, roles that we're looking to fill. We need some people to be in here to help guide people around and to hand out some things about our Christmas services, about the good news of Jesus that we celebrate at Christmas. Uh, there's some roles outside, uh, helping people and various things outside. There is the road stewarding as well that needs to take place. Some of you have helped us out with that in the past. It's been made easier uh, for you, that particular role. So you, uh, the chances of you receiving uh, angry tirades from motorists have been greatly reduced. Let me put it that way. Um, so if you're able to volunteer, please can you let me know or the, contact the church office, please, and they can... Uh, collate your information and then we'll be in touch with you. This is a great event that provides opportunity for us to connect with our community, to open our doors, to let people come in uh, and to go out as well to celebrate Jesus and his birth, the good news that he is our saviour, that God is with us. So we need your help to make it happen. You seem so excited about that. So please, <laughs> please do volunteer. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, before Bola come to lead us in prayer, you'll be aware that I've been asking uh, for people to share their stories, to share some testimonies about what God is up to in your life right now. And I'm pleased to say that Anne is going to come and share with us this morning a uh, testimony about an answer to prayer, I think, Anne, isn't it? Please do come. 
Thanks, Anne. Should we welcome Anne? Thank you. Uh, morning, all. Um, I'd just like to share a, a wonderful answer to prayer. Um, earlier in the year, we were preparing for the Thanksgiving service for my husband, Keith, and um, I mentioned to Phil that my sister would be coming, and she was heartbroken that her family was completely broken. Her three children had all fallen out with each other, hadn't spoken for years, and they'd also fallen out with their father, and he hadn't seen his daughters or grandchildren for an awful long time, and it was really sad. And my sister could see no way out of it. Anyway, wonderfully, they all wanted to come to the service to pay their respects to Keith. And um, when we knew they were all going to come, we started to pray and just said, Lord, please will you touch them and bring healing to this family. Anyway, wonderfully, they were all here on the day. They all sat separately around the church. And after the service... Um, over refreshments out there, the father went and talked to his children. And, um, and it was wonderful, and it was a safe environment. And since that day, they've been back talking to each other. Uh, they've met up, and they're building back on their relationships. So I just want to say thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer and bringing healing to that family. So, <laughs> Thanks so much, Anne, for sharing. Bola is going to come and lead us in some prayers now. Thanks, Bola. If you have testimonies, please do uh, come and let me know. And uh, you can either share from the front, as Anne has just done, or you can write them down and I'll read them on your behalf. But we want to hear stories of what God is doing in one another's lives. Bola, thank you. Good morning. Yeah. I pray that everyone here will connect with this prayer and those online would also connect with the prayer as well. Please let us pray. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning to give you praise and adoration. We praise you, Lord, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, King of Heaven. We praise you, the heavenly host, because you are great in power. You are mighty in battle and we also plead for mercy. Please have mercy on us. Also, we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, for your continued protection, for your continued blessings and directions in our lives. All glory and praise belongs to you, Lord. As we have come together to worship this morning, Lord, accept our praise and worship in Jesus' name we pray. Also, we praise you, Lord, for your grace and favor in our lives, for you are a dependable God, lovable God, reliable God, and trustworthy God. As it is written that you are the Lord who is and who was and who is to come, we honor you and praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Lord, have mercy. As Psalm 18, 2 reads, Our Lord is our rock, our fortress and our deliverer. Our God is our rock in whom we take refuge, our shield and the horn of our salvation, our stronghold. Then, Lord, we want to be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do prospers. We also thank you, Jesus, for bringing salvation to us by cleansing us from our sins. We pray that we would all be filled with the Holy Spirit and teach us how to continue to have a closer relationship with you, Lord. We pray that as Phil brings the word from the book of 2 Samuel, that we would have more understanding and wisdom. And also we pray that the glory of the Lord will fill this place today in Jesus' name we pray. Grant us wisdom and discernment, O oh Lord. We pray for our church. We pray that we continue to sense your presence in the midst of us on a daily basis, that the Lord in his infinite mercies would answer our heart desires. We pray for those that are finding life difficult during these challenging times. 
whether it be due to cost of living increases or anxiety due to inability to secure jobs or due to finding life difficult for a number of reasons. We pray that you bless us with your assurance and strength during these times. In Jesus' name we pray. We pray for God's continued grace, guidance, direction, and discernment in everything we do, and that you guide and protect all those who serve the church, who serve the people that come into this building. Bless them, direct them, and be with them at all times. We pray for our children. We pray for wisdom and knowledge for our children and grandchildren as they return back to school from half term, for those who have had their half term. Lord, we just pray that you continue to bless these children as they're the light of the world. Let your light shine in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. We also continue to pray for healing for those that are ill at home or in hospital. As they feel weak and weary, oh Lord, we pray that you make them strong. We pray that for divine visitation from you. Because with you, O oh Lord, all things are possible. Nothing is difficult for you to do, Lord. And as we come to you, O oh Lord, we depend on you because we know that, Lord, you are in control and you can do the unthinkable, you can turn things around. We just pray that you continue to be with us and that we have our hope, is, as our hope is found in you, that you bless and guide us. We pray for our government that the right decisions are made on a daily basis. We also pray for the world. We pray for the world and the world is becoming an interesting place to be. We pray for peace in the Middle East between the Israelis and the Palestines and that all the violence should stop in Jesus' name. We also pray for Ukraine. We continue to pray for Ukraine and Russia. We pray for Sudan that, oh Lord, you take control and that, Lord, you be with us all. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now before Phil comes to speak to us, there are two more songs to sing together, and I invite you to stand if you're able to do so and join with us.
Please sit down. The word in tongues, uh, language of the Holy Spirit and God's word teaches us that when that happens in a setting such as this, then we should seek an interpretation. Uh, so just let's be quiet. We've been singing about being still for the presence of the Lord is moving in this place. Uh, so let's be still. And if you feel that God gives you a word of encouragement as in way of interpretation for that word that Rowena has shared in tongues, then please speak it out loudly so we can hear it. Lord, would you please speak to us now through your spirit. Amen. Father God, your heart must break uh, for your world in so many ways. You are a God of peace. And yet there are wars raging. There is conflict in so many places. Sometimes we sing the song about breaking our heart for what breaks yours. Lord, that's a, that's a dangerous thing to say, uh, to sing in many ways. But Lord, we pray that you would give us your heart. And we continue to pray for peace in your world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as Colin said, we're continuing our series in 1 and 2 Samuel. And uh, I found it... Uh, extremely moving actually to be uh, reading stories about Israel at this time where their conflicts are raging there um, such disturbing and distressing scenes we see on our television screens don't we um, the realities of conflict and I, I've had opportunity over the last uh, couple of weeks to actually have conversations with people um, about this conflict in Israel-Palestine. And it's difficult to do that, isn't it? I found it difficult. It's hard to know what to say, how to respond. People, uh, the people I've spoken to know that I'm a Christian minister of a church. And, um, you know, they're looking for some kind of response from me. What, how am I reacting to this? And maybe you've come across that uh, as Christians. People, you know, are searching for answers, searching for hope, searching for what, what does Christianity make of all this? And I just want to encourage you to be open to those opportunities. Uh, pray that God would give you the words to say. Uh, and when those opportunities arise, God promises to do that in his word. He promises to give us words to say, uh, to express the hope that we have in Jesus as our Lord. So pray for that. Ask God. He will honor his promises, as we'll see in God's word today. Um, and, and be bold to speak out. Uh, 
God is a God of peace. When people have asked for my response, one of the things that I've said is, uh, you know, I'm not about taking sides. I don't think that's helpful. Uh, what I'm about is praying for peace. I'm on the side of peace. And um, perhaps that's something you would consider as, as a response you could give. Just, just trying to be helpful um, in that. But we're going to look at uh, 2 Samuel. And uh, at the beginning of this series, we watched a video that gave an overview of 1 Samuel. And we're going to look now at another video which gives us an overview of 2 Samuel. So if you could watch the screens, the video will play. The book of 2 Samuel. Check out the video on 1 Samuel where we were introduced to the book's three main characters, Samuel, Saul, and David. And then also to the book's literary design, which first introduced Samuel and then traced the rise and fall of King Saul in contrast to the rise of King David. 2 Samuel tells the story of David as Israel's king, and in two movements, there's a season of success and a blessing, followed by a huge moral failure and then its sad consequences. And then the book ends with this well-crafted conclusion that reflects back on the good and the bad in David's life, generating hope for a future king to come from his line. So 2 Samuel picks up after Saul's death, and David surprises everyone by composing this long poem where he laments the death of the very man who tried to murder him. And so once again, the author, he's presenting David's humility and compassion. He's a man who grieves the death even of his own enemies. After this, David experiences a season of success and God's blessing. All of the Israelite tribes, they come to David and then they ask him to unify all the tribes as their king. And so the first thing David does as king is to go to the city of Jerusalem. He conquers it and he establishes it as Israel's capital city, which he renames as Zion. And from there, David goes on and he wins many battles and expands Israel's territory. Now, after making Jerusalem the political capital of Israel, he wants to make it their religious capital as well. And so he has the Ark of the Covenant moved into the city. And then in 2 Samuel 7, he tells God, now that Israel has a permanent home, he thinks that God's presence should also get a permanent house. So he asks if he can build a temple for the God of Israel. But God says to David, thank you for that thought, but actually I'm going to build you a house, a dynasty. Now, 2 Samuel 7, this is a key chapter for understanding the storyline of the whole Bible. Because God here makes a promise to David that from his royal line will come a future king who's going to build God's temple here on earth and set up an eternal kingdom. And it's this messianic promise to David that gets picked up and developed more in the book of Psalms than also in the books of the prophets. And it's this king that gets connected to God's promise to Abraham. The future messianic kingdom will be how God brings his blessing to all of the nations. And it's right here in the midst of all this divine blessing that things go horribly wrong. David makes a fatal mistake, not fatal for him, but for a man named Uriah, one of David's prized soldiers. So from his rooftop, David sees Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, bathing. David finds her, he sleeps with her, gets her pregnant. And then he tries to cover the whole thing up by having Uriah assassinated and then marrying her. It's just horrible. So when David's confronted by the prophet Nathan about all of this, he immediately owns up to what he's done. He's broken, he repents, he asks God to forgive him, and God does forgive him, but God doesn't erase the consequences of David's decisions. And so as a result of this horrible choice, David's family, his kingdom, it all falls apart. And it makes this section a tragic story, much like Saul's downfall. So David's sons end up repeating his own mistakes, but in even more tragic ways. So Amnon sexually abuses his sister, Tamar, and then their brother Absalom finds out about all of this and has Amnon assassinated. And then Absalom goes and he hatches the secret plan to oust his father David from power, and he launches this full-scale rebellion. And so for a second time, David is forced to flee from his own home and go hide in the wilderness except this time he is not an innocent man. The rebellion ends when David's son is murdered, when it breaks David's heart. And so once again, he laments over the very man who tried to kill him. David's last days find him back on his throne, but as a broken man, he's wounded by the sad consequences of his sin. The book concludes with a well-crafted epilogue. 
with stories that are out of chronological order, but they have this really cool symmetrical literary design. So the outer pair of stories come from earlier in David's reign, and they compare the failures of Saul and then of David, and how each of them hurt other people through their bad decisions. The next inner pair of stories are about David and his band of mighty men who went about fighting the Philistines. And what's interesting is that both sections have a story of David's weakness in battle. So in contrast to the victorious David of chapters 1 through 9, here we see a vulnerable David who's dependent on others for help. The center of the epilogue has two poems that act like memoirs, and David reflects back on his life. And he remembers times when God graciously rescued him from danger. And he sees these as moments where God was faithful to his covenant promise to him and to his family. Both poems conclude by looking back onto the hope of God's promise of a future king who will build that eternal kingdom. Now these poems and then God's promise also connect back to Hannah's poem that opened the book. And so these key passages from the beginning, now the middle, and the end of the book bring the book's themes all together. Despite Saul and David's evil, God remained at work, moving forward his redemptive purposes. And God opposed David and Saul's arrogance, but he exalted David when he humbled himself. And so the future hope of this book reaches far beyond David himself. It looks to the future, to the messianic king who will one day bring God's kingdom and blessing to all of the nations. And that's what the book of Samuel is all about. There you go. Now you know what the book of Samuel 1 and 2, as we know them, are all about. Samuel 2 begins with David learning about Saul and Jonathan's death. Saul was his enemy who'd been trying to kill him. Jonathan was his best friend who he loved dearly. They were both now dead. And we can read about uh, that in 2 Samuel 1, verses 1 to 4. The words will be on the screen for you. After the death of Saul, David returned from striking down the Amalekites and stayed in Ziklag two days. On the third day, a man arrived from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he came to David, he fell to the ground to pay, honor, to pay him honour. Where have you come from? David asked. He answered, I have escaped from the Israelite camp. What happened? David asked. Tell me. The men fled from battle, he replied. Many of them fell and died, and Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. As we were remembering last week, David showed amazing respect for the fact that God was Saul's anointed king. Even though he had opportunities to kill this man who had been trying to murder him, he didn't take those opportunities. He didn't take matters into his own hands. Instead, he trusted God to fulfill his promises. So now as he hears about Saul's death, rather than celebrating, he continues to show that same love and respect for God's anointed king, Saul. He leads the people in a time of national mourning and he laments the death of Israel's king and the nation's defeat in battle. And again, we can learn from David about loving our enemies and also respecting those who God has called to particular tasks. Even though Saul had turned away from God, even though he'd done many wrong things in all sorts of ways, and especially against David, David refused to celebrate Saul's death as good news for him. And I just was struck by the contrast there of, of David's reaction and response to how things happen in the world around us today. I was just thinking back to, you know, when Osama bin Laden was, uh, was killed, you know, when Saddam Hussein uh, was toppled, and, and the kind of victrios, you know, celebration of those deaths is such a contrast, isn't it, to how David responds here. And I think David's response is much more healthy. We can celebrate that evil has been defeated, and that peace reigns, they're good things to celebrate, but celebrating someone's death, it's not, it's not right, is it? Someone God loves, someone who Jesus died for. We can learn from David. 
Now, for those of us who live in relatively stable countries like the United Kingdom, it can be hard to appreciate how significant, in fact, the death of a leader in a less stable nation really is. Everything can be thrown up in the air. A sense of uncertainty and fear comes across the whole nation. What will happen next? Who will step into that leadership role left by the one who's died? What will they be like? How will this affect me and my family and my work and my life? These times of leadership change can be really unsettling. We've been through leadership changes in the not-too-distant past, haven't we? The Queen died, and now we have King Charles, but you know, it didn't really affect us that much, did it? Yeah, we were sad, obviously, and we mourned the Queen's death, but life didn't change, hasn't changed that much, has it? We go through general elections, and yeah, different political parties with different... Uh, ways of, of leading and, and different priorities maybe, but does life really change that much? It was very different for these people. Instability and fear can often lead to fighting within nations after the death of a significant leader, and that's exactly what happened in Israel. The civil, civil war with various members of uh, family members of Saul and those who are loyal to him forming one side and then David and those who are loyal to him forming the other. The tribe and region of Judah chose to elect David as their king and God remains with David so when those conflicts David and his men are victorious time and again. The other thing that can happen when a significant leader dies in an unstable region is that other nations around see an opportunity to try and grab some power and attack the weakened nation. And that's exactly what happens. The Philistines rise up against Israel once again. And perhaps we can read all this and think that's a long time ago and a long way away. What on earth has it got to do with us? But as I said, I, I've just been so moved and found it really challenging looking through this story, reading about Israel and conflict and nation against nation. And it's happening. It's happening again. And, and we see the reality and the lives torn apart by it, people dying, uh, you know, huge explosions and attacks and fighting and hostages, and it's atrocious, isn't it? It's horrific. And sometimes I think we can read these Bible stories and think, you know, just not think about the reality of living through that for the people involved. And, um, you know, that's, that's one thing that we, we see today much more uh, easily on our screens. We continue to cry out to God for peace in his world. Through all of this uncertainty, through all this conflict and pain, David remains faithful to God, and God remains faithful to his covenant promises to David. And eventually, after lots of conflicts, negotiation, and far too many needless deaths, David is anointed over king of all of Israel, and we can read about that in 2 Samuel 5, verses 1 to 5. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel, and you shall become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah for seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned over Israel and Judah for 33 years. David had to wait a very long time. From that moment when Samuel anointed him as king over Israel, probably something like 20 years. It's a long time to wait, isn't it? The way that David journeyed through that 20-year period teaches us a lot about patience, about leaving things in God's hands, about trusting God, about remaining faithful to him, trusting that he will keep his promises even when the world around us doesn't look like he will or he is. We can learn about patience from David. And I hold my hands up before you right now and say, I struggle with patience. I wonder if you can relate. So many things in our lives today are instant, aren't they? We get used to things happening very quickly. And when that doesn't happen, 
we can struggle. I'm not very good at waiting. If the driver in front of me doesn't proceed the second the traffic light turns green, I get impatient. If the delivery doesn't arrive on time, I get impatient. When the children aren't ready to leave the house, I get impatient. When the person doesn't respond to my message, when the kettle takes forever to boil, when the results don't arrive from the doctor, when that person is running late again. I get impatient. What about you? Perhaps these everyday examples of impatience speak to us of a deeper underlying attitude of impatience that can seep into every area of our lives. Maybe we would do well to learn from David. He's willing to wait for God to work things out. And when things around him seem to be falling apart, he goes to God and says, Lord, what should I do? How should I respond to this? And we might kind of look at David and think, you know, he's this king and he's this high up mighty person. He's a man of God and and all those things are true. But we need to be careful to not forget that he's just an ordinary person just like you and I. And we can learn from him and his willingness to let God be God and just play his role in God's plans. He continuous, continuously throughout this story goes to God and say, says to him, Lord, which way now? What should I do now? And sometimes he goes to God with his impatience. We can look in the Psalms and see times where David cries out to God, Lord, please help me. Can you relate to that? Maybe you've been praying for the same thing or for the same person for years and years. And it's hard to do that, isn't it? To keep on praying for that family member or that friend or that neighbour or that situation. You know, how long have people been praying for peace in Israel? You know? It could be hard, but we can learn from from this story that God is able to use those who will be patient. Who will wait for him, who will continue to seek him, continue to pray those prayers. So brothers and sisters, I would say to you, I just want to encourage you, just just keep going. And maybe you've been praying for something for many, many years. Maybe maybe even those prayers have kind of dried up a bit because, you you know, it's easy for that to happen, isn't it, when you've been praying for so long for the same thing? It's hard to keep going back, but God, God knows our hearts. He hears the cries of our hearts. They're just as much prayer as, as the words we might say out loud or pray in our heads to him, but... Keep on, be persistent, keep seeking God, be patient. Let's learn from David. And by the time we reach chapter 7, God has given David victory over his enemies. And finally, Israel enters into a time of peace. And we'll read about what happens. Again, the words will be on the screen for you, 2 Samuel 7. We're going to read the whole chapter. Just as we read through this quite long passage, as we read through, be thinking about What does this tell us about who God is? And then, so there's a bit that God says this is what he's going to do. And there's a bit where David responds to what God has told him about what he's going to do. So what what does it tell us about who God is? And what difference does that make? And how can we learn from the way that David responds? Is that okay? So two questions to have in your mind as we're reading through the passage. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, He said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. You are the one to build me a house. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, And appointed you ruler over my people Israel. 
I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people shall not oppress them any more as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and he said, Who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of your house, the house of your servant. And this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, sovereign Lord. For the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. How great you are, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you. There is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. And who is like your people, Israel, the one nation on earth that God went out to redeem as a people for himself and to make a name for himself and to perform great and awesome wonders by driving out nations and their gods from before your people, whom you redeemed from Egypt. You have established your people Israel as your very own forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promised, so that your name will be great forever. Then people will say, The Lord Almighty is God over Israel, and the house of your servant David will be established in your sight. Lord Almighty, God of Israel, you have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build a house for you. So your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. Sovereign Lord, you are God. Your covenant is trustworthy, and you have promised these good things to your servant. Now be, now be pleased to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever in your sight. For you, Sovereign Lord, have spoken. And with your blessing, the house of your servant will be blessed forever. So David pledges to build God this house, a house for the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, a house for God himself. But God responds by making promises to David and says, actually, you're not the one to build the house. It will build your son. And those promises that God makes reach forward and look not only to Solomon, who would come after David and build the temple, but forward to Jesus, who would be the king, the ultimate king above all kings, and even on into the future forevermore. God is faithful. God is working his purposes out. No matter what the circumstances of life may be, those truths are unshakable. And it can be hard, can't it, to hold on to those when we see the mess the world is in, when our lives hurt so much so often. It can be hard, can't it, to tr keep trusting. But brothers and sisters, God is faithful. He is working his purposes out. He does keep his promises the ultimate promise that we cling to at this time, as at all times, is that God has said, Jesus will return. Jesus said, I will come back. And so we cling to that promise, the hope that we have for the future. 
that things will be set straight, that God's will will be done on earth as in heaven. God is faithful. There will be a time when peace reigns in Israel. There will be a time when peace reigns in Ukraine. There will be a time when peace reigns in Sudan. In every area and in every nation, in every household, in every family. Isn't it wonderful to hear that answer to prayer from man about, about people coming together in family who've been in conflict? You know, these are just uh, like foreshadowings of the promises that God gives us. There will be peace. And we pray for it now. But we know the time is coming when God will work it out in full. God is faithful. We have hope. Cling on to that hope. Never lose it. God also promises to be with us. He says, never will I leave you nor forsake you. Never. Never, ever, ever. God is with us here and now in the mess. In all the rubbish we have to deal with, in all the pain and the grief, God is with us. And he is powerful He's big enough for all of our problems, even the biggest of our problems. He is working his purposes out. And David is humble, isn't he? David is humble in the way that he receives God's incredible promise to him and about him and his household and his family. You know, any of you who, who have children, you know, we want the best for our children, don't we? We want them to do well in life. We want them to be healthy. We want them to you know, succeed in the things they want to succeed in. We want them to, to, to have a good life and to be happy, don't we? Because we love them. And God gives David amazing promises about his children, his descendants, and his grandchildren, and his great-grandchildren, and his great-great, and keep going. And David's response isn't to strut around the place saying, look at me, I'm the man. But he says, God, I, I don't deserve this. Who am I? You would promise this to me. And humility is something that God can use so powerfully. And David was humble, at least at this point in his life. And we can learn from his humility and seek to emulate that, to follow his example in our lives. When things are going well, you know, many of us work hard or have worked hard for the things that we have, and that's great, that's fine. But you know, it all comes from God, actually. And it all belongs to him. And having that humility to accept that and to be all right with that and to hold the things that we have lightly before God and say, this is all yours, God. Use it how you want to. So God can use that attitude so powerfully if we're willing to do that. The world would tell us that, you know, grab it. (laughs) It's yours. You earned it. Keep hold of it, protect it from others. God would say, have these great things. He loves to give us his blessings, his good things. He loves to pour out his blessings upon us. Let's learn from David's example and hold them lightly and say, God, we're not worthy of this. Thank you, God. It's all yours. Take and use it and me however you want to. And he will. He will. So uh, quite a lot that we've covered, kind of uh, 2 Samuel chapters 1 to 8. I'd encourage you to read the story for yourself and to keep praying for Israel this week. But what can we learn about God? We learn that God is faithful. No matter what is happening in the world around us, God is faithful. He is with us. We can learn that we should be patient. Continually continuously seeking God and not grabbing things for ourselves, taking matters in our own hands, but saying, God, what should I do? And be patient for God to work and to act in our lives. And we should be humble following David's example, giving everything back to God. Just be quiet for a few moments. I've said a lot of words. We've seen a video. We've read a lot of God's words. What are the things that God is saying to you 
this morning. Be, be quiet for a few moments and consider that before I pray. Father God, I thank you that you are an everyday God, not just a Sunday God. Lord, help us to apply the truths that we learn about you and the world and the way we should live. Help us to apply these truths that we learn from your word to our everyday lives, that we may be everyday Christians, not just Sunday Christians. Father, we thank you that you are faithful. Lord, help us to keep trusting in you. Thank you that the promises you make, you keep without exception. Help us to keep standing on your promises, God. May they bring us hope in the midst of the difficulties of everyday life. Father, please help us to be patient. Help us to wait for you, God, to follow your lead, not to run ahead of you or to lag behind you, but to keep in step with you and your Holy Spirit. Help us to be patient, Lord, with one another too. And Father, please keep us humble. Help us to remember that everything comes from you. And may we always be willing to use the things that we have, the opportunities that we have, the people that we are. Help us to use all this to serve and worship you. Thank you, God, that like David, you can use ordinary people like us to build your kingdom in your world. Lord, maybe we're not called to be kings or queens of nations, but you have roles for us to play in your plans and purposes. Lord, help us just keeping in tune with you. And may your will be done and on earth as in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let's uh, stand and sing our final song together. Lord, make me a mountain standing tall for you.
Let's pray together. Father God, we come to you at the end of our time together here and ask for your blessing and your guidance. May your presence go with us, bringing your light to our workplaces, our homes, and as we meet with each other. May your love shine through us, touching the lives of those we meet. Help us to be salt and light in a world that needs your truth and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.